So good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us in the first day of the International Festival of Public Health. Um, we thought at the European Public Health Association, uh, the sections of uh, law and public health and the health technology assessment, along with the University of Manchester and the University of Crete, that we would hold the session in the context of the festival to discuss a little bit what we all are hearing about um, the TRIPS uh, flexibilities and the waiver, and of course the pandemic treaty, and also bring to the public health community some people from the field um, uh, of law. Um, particularly going a little bit broader than traditional, if you like, uh, public health and law domains, going into IP rights, uh, intellectual property rights, um, and also to bring um, interdisciplinarily scientists uh, from biology uh, and to see whether we can have, uh, whether we can give you a, a flavor or a taste on, on what's happening at the moment and where different uh, parts of the research practice um, and public health communities uh, uh, are positioned. In terms of, of the actual uh, event, I need to say that we are recording it. We're not streaming it because we have an overlap with um, the previous event, uh, but we will be uploading it. Uh, we do hope that you are all comfortable uh, if you switch on your camera or if you ask a question, because we, we may give you the floor at the end. We will have time for questions. Um, bear in mind that we are recording. Um, if you have a question because there's no Q&A function, kindly put it in the chat. We will monitor. Um, also, 10 days ago, we held another event with uh, the French Society of Public Health, the European Public Health Association and the Health Technology Assessment Session, where we had um, uh, Professor Stiglitz presenting for economics and Ellen Tehon, who's also with us today, discussing more aspects of access and George Pavlakis and um, also colleagues from like uh, Andia Samoa from the Global South and as uh, Mackelberge discussing ethics. That session is recorded and we'll put it in the chat. Um, we did collect questions from there because we weren't able to answer all of them. And we will collect questions today. And these will be built in a document and we will make them available, hopefully in the next two weeks. So thank you. And then going straight into the first speaker, which is George Pavlakis. So George Pavlakis is a senior investigator uh, in the vaccines branch and the head of the human retrovirus sections, um, the National Cancer Institute of the NIH. He's a holder, which is of particular interest to us of um, more than a couple of dozen, I think 70 patents uh, on vaccine research and uh, also human growth hormone. Uh, and I think all his patents, unless I'm gravely mistaken, are handled by the NIH. Um, of course, he has a body of research spanning three, four decades on HIV and also more recently on DNA vaccines. And he would be kind enough to tell us where we find ourselves in the currently in the pandemic and what we're discussing in terms of knowledge transfer and also what we're discussing in terms of potentially a little bit of dynamics on, on uh, vaccine patterns and innovative, if you like, uh, tools. So, Professor Pavlakis? Um, can I share my screen? Thank you very much. Uh, I have prepared slides. They are a little overloaded, but uh, I believe that uh, having the benefit of uh, recording and reviewing, uh, this uh, would not be a tremendous burden. Uh, do you see my screen? We see your screen and it's in slideshow. Uh, so please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, the, uh, the next slide is my, uh, I can manage to forward my conflicts and disclaimers. And um, I want to start by just uh, uh, um, underscoring the fact that uh, we're still early in the pandemic. Uh, and um, right now we're getting close to 200 million um, reported cases uh, in the world. Uh, and um, we have uh, just uh, uh, 4 million uh, or so recorded deaths so far. And um, the scary thing is that um, uh, each million of deaths uh, happens in shorter and, sh shorter and shorter period of time, even without uh, the complete accounting of uh, India, 
we have less than three months, uh, the fourth million um, of, uh, of uh, deaths. So uh, in my opinion, uh, if anything, uh, the uh, epidemic is accelerating worldwide. At the beginning of the epidemic, the CDRAP organization tried to predict what is going to happen. We now know that we have a similar um, uh, uh, pattern of waves like uh, the old um, uh, flu epidemics, uh, successive waves and um, fall peaks uh, in many parts of the world like uh, we see. So um, the pandemic is still early. Uh, we uh, are not uh, going to get rid of the virus so uh, easy. And uh, the scary part uh, uh, right now is that uh, we do have a, a almost new worldwide um, epidemic of the Delta variant and several others, but Delta threatens to be the most um, 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 uh, you know, prominent right now. Uh, and uh, this uh, has uh, produced uh, a new epidemics uh, of a very sharp uh, uh, increase in, in cases of um, coronavirus infection in many parts of the world. Um, and uh, you see, uh, compared to the uh, previous wave of the epidemic, uh, this uh, uh, new uh, epidemic, mostly by the Delta variant, um, is uh, uh, threatening a lot of parts of uh, the world, especially also um, the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so uh, why this is happening is because uh, the virus uh, mutates and creates um, uh, mutants that um, are better transmitted and also they can um, uh, evade pa uh, partially, not, thankfully not yet completely, uh, the immune system or as is stimulated by prior infection or by vaccines. Uh, so um, the, the bottom line is that uh, uh, the coronavirus is much more easily um, transmitted than say, for example, flu um, and the new mutants, they are uh, way better so uh, instead of um, uh, the, uh, the coronavirus transmitted um, uninterrupted uh, in, in two or three uh, persons from one infected person on the average, now we have uh, the case that uh, the new coronavirus Delta can be transmitted to five to eight um, uh, people from one infected person. So it is uh, uh, very concerning and threatening worldwide. And uh, we um, may see even uh, more mutants uh, with different properties. Lambda is um, uh, a concern in South America, for example. Now, of course, we have very good vaccines uh, in record time. This is um, an amazing feat of international medicine and, and cooperation. But um, as you see in this map in dark colors, um, the vaccine is distributed mostly in rich countries and, and probably 2% or less of people, depending on what you count, uh, in 2% uh, of people in poor countries have been vaccinated. So we have a problem. Uh, so, in, in just briefly, in conclusion, I leave you with these, um, um, uh, you know, bullets that um, uh, the epidemic is expanding. The new variants are uh, threatening to prolong and expand the epidemic. We do have safe and effective vaccines. This is the brightest um, uh, part of the equation. They were developed in record time. Uh, but um, the, uh, in my personal opinion, and uh, now I believe of many others and some countries uh, that have successfully fought the virus, uh, the way to go is elimination, not the mitigation of the virus. And the uh, countries that they have um, uh, opted to really uh, block the virus completely they have fared much better in, in, uh, in terms of uh, the epidemic damage. Uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, North America and Europe 
has opted for mitigation uh, to rely on uh, vaccines to um, uh, block the epidemic in the long run. Uh, but I believe that right now this is uh, mitigation is a major mistake, especially against the Delta variant that uh, causes uh, another violent uh, uh, wave. And um, as um, uh, the virus expands worldwide, it creates very dangerous new mutants. Uh, they adapt better to the human population. Uh, they transmit faster and, um, and can be transmitted even to um, uh, previously uh, infected people. Uh, so um, we see a virus to attempt to escape uh, our immune system. And we do have scary situations in parts of the world with uh, uh, coronavirus um, devastating places that they have high HIV incidence like uh, um, South Africa. And also using um, this pool of um, patients that uh, they have a damaged immune system to um, work in the long run to produce um, additional um, uh, variants, stealth variants. Uh, and uh, unfortunately also we have the double pandemic of the coronavirus and misinformation. Um, uh, as uh, you know, that uh, in my opinion has uh, uh, caused tremendous damage uh, to the cause of eliminating the virus. So, um, my opinion is that we do need to, um, uh, we are, uh, the virus is uh, spreading like um, um, uh, wildfire in, in, in a dense forest. Uh, and um, we are not going to uh, get rid of it until we extinguish completely um, uh, the, um, uh, all the, the fires and the, the embers that uh, exist. Um, when do we expect uh, to build enough uh, so-called herd immunity? Uh, this for a, a virus like the coronavirus, and as you see also for flu, it will be extremely difficult anymore. Um, and um, the answer to me now is probably never. Um, new variants are um, emerging, causing uh, new epidemics. And even in places that they have uh, high seropositivity or they have been protected by some um, partially uh, working vaccines, you do see new variants and, and new epidemics and in some places, um, while the spread of the virus again. So the, the, the pandemic is an internationally major threat. Um, the virus and its progeny is gonna stay uh, with us for a long time. Um, we expect um, uh, something like the flu models with the periodic epidemics, especially in um, um, the winter uh, period uh, or in closed spaces. And um, uh, I do want to underscore, double underscore, that the pandemic that we see and several to come, I believe, are interlinked with climate change and the ecosystem damage that uh, we produce daily. Therefore, we need a global strategy uh, against uh, climate change that will also address many other issues. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, vaccine is our uh, miracle weapon, um, uh, the strongest weapon to address the epidemics. We will uh, have drugs, but um, not, uh, um, uh, not immediately. Um, so I do want to say that the previous rabbit project progress during the years of the AIDS uh, epidemic, which continues, and bioterrorism concerns, they resulted in an infrastructure uh, that advanced vaccine development. So now um, we, have, we, have, we were a little bit uh, more ready to address the epidemic. And uh, of course, massive government support also helped. Um, but we do need um, to um, uh, address uh, the urgent need for rapid vaccine production and distribution worldwide. And uh, of course, this pandemic is the poster child for um, uh, attempting coordinate global action 
um, which is urgently needed. Um, and the main argument is by protecting everybody in uh, poor countries um, around the world, not only we protect ourselves, uh, uh, protect them, but we also protect uh, ourselves in uh, richer uh, countries uh, and uh, contribute to the elimination of the global epidemic uh, very rapidly. So as a veteran of older uh, fights uh, with um, AIDS, I want to say that uh, AIDS have been in the uh, uh, previous 40 years, a very important um, um, factor for addressing uh, uh, global issues. And uh, just to tell you that we are um, uh, uh, at 40, 40, 40, 40 years of AIDS pandemic, around 40 million victims, uh, dead people so far, and around 40 million people living with AIDS. We have not finished, it's an active pandemic, but, uh, and we do not have vaccines, but do, we do have um, very good drugs and prevention strategies. And the AIDS was um, the first uh, the strong case where um, uh, countries uh, tried to uh, um, uh, challenge the international model of rich countries producing uh, uh, stuff and selling it to extravagant prices to the rest of the world. And um, uh, so uh, many things were done and the AIDS activists were instrumental in, in changing this uh, uh, previous model that uh, the rich countries were fighting for themselves and they uh, very little was done for poor places like Africa where the epidemic was um, ravaging their societies. Uh, so the, it was established that um, uh, the right to health care is indeed a human right, uh, uh, overriding um, intellectual property issues of um, rich countries and companies. And um, uh, so uh, I think that with this background, uh, the question becomes, how do we achieve presently better international cooperation? Uh, the, the, the problem is big and urgent and long lasting. Uh, uh, there are some mechanisms in place, but such as CEPI and COVAX, but they have not been fully successful yet because few vaccines have been distributed in, in poor countries. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, and these are personal opinions, of course, from now on, uh, most practical approach is to depend on established and rapidly expanding manufacturing capacity, especially in rich and uh, developing countries um, with proven um, uh, capacity to uh, build and, uh, uh, vaccines and produce them in massive scales. And uh, in a way, um, excessive reliability on uh, patent waivers as there were the initial um, um, uh, proposals uh, may at the end be disruptive in the long term and may not be effective in the short term, um, uh, especially because uh, uh, patents is the least in the, of the problem, in my opinion. Uh, they become public property after several years. But uh, the, um, uh, it's important to look globally at uh, uh, company know-how and trade secrets and also uh, key material supplies that are essential uh, for um, having a functional system. Uh, and I must underscore that the pandemic damaged the international trade and open borders, so which threatens uh, the way of doing things. Uh, but uh, uh, the other issue is that focusing on compulsory licensing in parallel import, that means import in countries uh, that do not produce from uh, cheap suppliers, um, has to be sparingly, otherwise it uh, may interrupt the international trade in unpredictable uh, ways. And um, it seems to me that the more specific treaty addressing pandemics uh, and how to operate under these conditions may be in the long run a better international answer. But for now, um, um, a lot of rich countries and uh, companies, um, um, they have counter arguments for opening up um, indiscreetly intellectual property, uh, claiming that new drugs are long and expensive to discover and develop. Uh, 
and um, uh, the requirements that we have as human society in very high uh, quality, high safety and efficacy um, and of, uh, of the vaccines and drugs that we produce um, impose um, um, uh, uh, limits uh, and uh, makes the whole thing expensive and time consuming. Uh, the compulsory licensing and parallel import may be disruptive if it is um, um, not used sparingly, although we must underscore that many countries uh, have the ability to do that, uh, relate, uh, I mean, uh, reserve the right to themselves to do it, including, of course, USA, England, and others. Um, but um, uh, the, there are uh, uh, additional problems like, uh, for example, as I briefly tried to uh, underscore, South Africa started with the AIDS epidemic to try to um, um, uh, find a different model. But 20 years later from this uh, fight, South Africa does not produce AIDS drugs, it relies on imports. Um, so, um, and there are a lot of other issues like um, uh, how do we guard internationally for abuse and uh, low quality and counterfeit um, products. Um, uh, so I believe that in the long run, without strong and consistent IP protection, um, there may be uh, disruptions and uh, less incentive for investment, um, especially in um, the leading countries like uh, USA. Um, so um, I will just um, uh, uh, mention that uh, a, a simple proposal that is in the mind of everybody, I guess, is that um, uh, we have to establish uh, new international practices. Uh, but, and uh, a simple one in general would be that vaccines and therapeutics addressing the epidemic will be distributed worldwide and uh, countries will pay according to their income and ability. Uh, so therefore, rich countries will subsidize the vaccines for poor countries, um, but in uh, uh, allowing also a reasonable profit for uh, innovators in this space. Otherwise, we may have um, uh, in the long run uh, major disruptions. Of course, um, there, there are several issues with that. I will just flash them here and I'll stop uh, because I exceeded my time, I believe. Thank you very much. So thank you very, very much. We do have a question in the audience and I have a couple myself. Um, but before that, I'll introduce Dimitra who has joined us, who is um, the managing director of the European Network um, for combating uh, fraud and corruption in healthcare, and who is also a member uh, of UFA and is kindly co moderating with me uh, because she has the first question for you, uh, George. So, Dimitra. Uh, thank you, Elena. Um, well, uh, I would like to, uh, to raise a question for Professor Pavlakis, and that is uh, given the um, the current dynamics of the pandemics that were very well shown during the presentation and also given the experience that we have from uh, past pandemics such as uh, HIV or Ebola, uh, do you think uh, that uh, we could achieve concrete results by using uh, the waiver? That is my question. Thank you. Yes, I think that um, um, what we um, uh, so in the last uh, year or half year that we do have uh, vaccines, approved vaccines uh, right now, is um, the willingness and the ability of the established uh, manufacturers uh, in, uh, in rich and developing countries to expand rapidly um, their production. So right now we have delivered um, uh, more than 3.6 billion vaccine doses. As I said, especially in the in the in the rich countries, uh, ignoring to a, a certain extent uh, the rest of the world. But this is um, a a great achievement because uh, soon enough I think that we're going to have 
delivered in uh, less than a year um, a, a number of vaccines that it was the totality of international production of vaccines in previous years. So uh, I don't know exactly the, how many billion doses of vaccines um, are produced internationally, but um, they are estimated about, let's say, um, uh, four billions or, or so, um, maybe more in some uh, uh, time. So uh, uh, delivering um, three and uh, uh, 3.6 billions approximately of um, uh, coronavirus vaccine is a tremendous achievement. So the international pharmaceutical establishment showed that they responded. So in the short run, I think that the safest is to find a way to further expand um, production. And um, the industry now is making agreements that uh, they've just announced with South Africa, for example, J&J and, &J and uh, lots of uh, manufacturing in India and many other places. Um, this, in the short run, is the best bet um, through um, uh, company agreements that are expanding. But there is no question in my mind that uh, as a, a, a global village and as uh, concerned humanity, we can do better and we should do better. But this should be in the long run. And in my humble opinion, should be... Um, uh, of course, uh, debated and, and tried uh, to be focused, uh, especially on epidemics that uh, may be uh, coming, more are coming. Um, so thanks very much for the detailed answer. Perhaps I can, I can fill in because we had a WTO briefing on the 29th of June. And um, with there, there are at the moment, uh, there are 83 uh, producing sites. Unfortunately, they're not proportionately, uh, if you like, located because there's only one in Africa across the world. So 83 across the world. The projected uh, number of doses for the end of 2021 is actually uh, over 11 million, which is 11 billion, which is actually massive. It, it goes geometrically. Um, not of the ones that are currently approved, of all the ones that we're seeing. I mean, uh, may, maybe we co I can copy the briefing in the chat for whomever is interested. Um, having said she, that... Just, uh, just to, to, to say that, it's, uh, uh, to me, it's an amazing achievement. It is. Uh, second to none so far. I mean, we uh, never uh, in the previous history, humanity has produced that many vaccines uh, of any kind that fast and distributed uh, unfairly, if you want, but uh, at least they were produced. And, uh, and I think that once they are plenty some, they will find their way to, um, to everybody. So in the, to very quickly, the, the question in the chat is whether uh, zero COVID, which we've been discussing also in publishing since Christmas, whether it's still a, a, a realistic uh, possible elimination strategy to battling COVID. That was the question. Well, it is, it is for New Zealand. It was um, for um, Taiwan for a long time. It, it is for the countries that uh, they tried hard. Australia tries hard. Um, the problem is that uh, no man is an island. Uh, I mean, if uh, the rest of the world uh, has a different opinion and uh, they're careless, the countries uh, like New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, uh, many others, I mean, China uh, eliminated uh, the virus for a long, long time. Now they are threatened by the Delta, um, which is scary because uh, it, uh, you know, it catches us like wildfire from the air. Uh, uh, but uh, I believe that the success the previous year of many countries in the world show the way. No virus uh, is good virus. I mean, we have, in my opinion, we have to eliminate it and uh, zero virus is the best policy. Thank you. I do have a number of questions in terms of uh, public funding and so on, but because we're over time, I keep them for the end. And um, Dimitra, I think if you could kindly introduce Ellen. Yes, yes, gladly.
Well, our next uh, speaker is uh, Ellen Tehan. Uh, Ellen Tehan is the Director of Medicine, Law and uh, Policy. She has been the creator of MPP, Medicine Pattern Pool of, uh, within WHO. Um, also, she has been the director of Médecins Sans Frontières and uh, personally uh, speaking, uh, her writings has been always a source of inspiration during hard litigation disputes uh, in front of the uh, Council of the State, which is the highest administrative court in Greece. With that saying, uh, I leave uh, the floor uh, to her. Thank you. And, and also I will interject and say that Dimitra and Ellen, and Ellen, we use you a lot in the in Greek court, that's true. So, and Elena and, uh, sorry, and Dimitra and Ellen are together in the WHO's Fair Pricing Group, which needs its own dedicated sessions. But thanks. Thank, thank you, Elena, and thank you, Dimitra, for this very uh, generous uh, introduction. And it's it's always good to hear that the work that we do and the, 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 the things that we publish um, find, find are found useful and to to learn that they find their way into Greek courts made my day. Um, I have a, uh, a presentation which I will start sharing now. Okay, there, there we go. So I will talk a little bit about intellectual property and access to, access to COVID-19 vaccines and I'll conclude with a recommendation for the pandemic uh, treaty. Uh, this is my interest declaration. Uh, we're self-employed. Uh, we work for non-for-profits, uh, only governments and um, academia, UN included. We have the occasional grants. Our work is open access and freely available. And this is our web website. We also have a newsletter. I encourage everyone to sign up for that if this is an issue that is of interest to you or if you want to learn more about it. The... Okay. Quickly about patents, because that is uh, often at the heart of many of these, of these discussions. Patents are one form of intellectual property most relevant in the field of, uh, of medicines because they, they give the creator um, the, uh, the right to uh, exclude others from using the invention for a certain period of time. Um, that is minimum 20 years. In the case of medicines, it's often longer because many, um, many jurisdictions offer patent extensions beyond those, uh, those 20 years. Um, this is a, uh, it is a social policy tool. Patents are meant to benefit both the inventor as well as the public at, at large. It needs to benefit the society and the intellectual property system has, of course, been globalized through the rules of the World Trade Organization. So here we talk about the world society at large that needs to benefit from it. But we also have to acknowledge that it comes with a cost. We've seen that most clearly, of course, in the field of HIV, where 20 years ago, huge battles broke out over access to antiretroviral medicines that had become available in high income countries, but were not available in the countries where uh, people with HIV were living. And it was that battle that led to a rethinking of the system at the World Trade Organization. Of course, the TRIPS agreement, that is the, the, the agreement that lays out the minimum requirements for the protection of intellectual property, stands for trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, uh, was negotiated well before uh, even HIV was, uh, was known. And in 2001, because of the debates and the conflicts and, and, and the legal conflicts that had broken out around medicines access and medicines patents, the, uh, the ministerial conference adopted the Doha Declaration on Trips and Public Health. And what that de declaration actually does was it said uh, the, the right to protect public health is more important. And that it, should, it gave primacy to the protection of, uh, of public health. And the declaration goes on to describe the kinds of measures that the TRIPS agreement holds for countries to deploy, such as compulsory licensing, uh, parallel imports, exceptions to patent rights, etc. All countries um, on the planet have provisions for the use of these, what have become known as the TRIPS 
flexibilities, and those flexibilities have been absolutely crucial in the in the field of of HIV, where low cost generic medicines were available, but could not without a license be used in jurisdictions where these patents were were, were granted. Now. Uh, fast forward to the COVID-19 crisis. For those of you in the UK, happy Freedom Day, I believe it's, it's what, it's, um, what the government has, has, has announced. I wish you the best of luck, certainly after listening, after, uh, listening to, to Dr. Uh, Pavlakis. Uh, one, one should wonder about the wisdom of some of our government's um, uh, policies. There is a disconnect often, however, between what government state and what governments uh, do. We've seen that a lot in the last year and a half. Now, global pandemic of unprecedented proportions, there's no news there. Unprecedented response, the global collaboration in the world of science has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, the financing that has been made available to advance these innovations, in particular the development of COVID-19 vaccines, unprecedented and absolutely phenomenal, something very much to be, uh, to be applauded. Uh, but it raises, of course, the questions around the creation of new intellectual property that takes place with this public financing. And we, we heard in the earlier days of the pandemic, um, a bold promises, bold commitments by world leaders that such vaccines, for example, would be global public goods. In the words of Emmanuel Macron, for example, he said no one will own this, this vaccine. The um, negotiating directive, this is the agreement between the European Commission and the EU member states, which gave the Commission the mandate to negotiate procurement of uh, COVID-19 vaccines on behalf of the member states, has a very interesting paragraph uh, where the Commission commits to promoting the COVID-19 vaccine as a global public good. It has a reference to uh, access to for low and middle income countries and the sharing of intellectual property, especially when such intellectual property has been developed with uh, public support. A very interesting clause in this negotiating directive, uh, but if you analyze the advanced purchase agreements that the Commission subsequently entered into, this commitment is nowhere to be found. The global expenditure on both vaccines and therapeutics has been, um, has been phenomenal, uh, around 93 billion. Um, if you look at Germany, has, has been an, a very important contributor to the development of the what has now become the Pfizer vaccine, but was one day the BioNTech vaccine with, uh, with almost half a billion um, uh, in, in financing. Uh, so did the European Investment Bank. Now, these would have been opportunities to give hands and feet to this commitment of promoting vaccines as global public goods. Because if you spend that kind of money, you can also attach conditions to that. But that has not really happened. That was, however, the expectation because after all, the research and the development is paid for. So these arguments that if you have a more lenient approach to intellectual property or you demand a sharing of the intellectual property, that that would affect the ability of these researchers to develop the vaccines doesn't really fly in the case of COVID-19 because those that were developing the vaccines and were bringing them to market were com almost completely de-risked by uh, with, with public financing, which is a very good thing. Let me be clear about it. I think that is exactly what should have happened. But another thing should have happened, and that is conditionality. That expectation was behind the establishment in May of last year of the COVID-19 technology access pool by the World Health Organization. Somewhat similar initiative to the medicines, uh, the medicines, um, the medicines patent pool, which <clears throat> 10 years ago took off as, uh, as an initiative for, for HIV. The idea was to offer a platform to share the intellectual property, the technology, the know-how and the material needed to scale up both the development and the production of COVID-19 health products. It's not limited to vaccines. And as I said, the expectation was because of the government financing that this would make 
uh, making the, the COVID-19 pool a reality much easier. The reality today is that the COVID-19 pool is still empty. This is, of course, also the backdrop against which we need to, to look at the TRIPS waiver proposal made in October by South Africa and India at the, at the TRIPS Council, at the World Trade Organization. And what the TRIPS waiver would do, and that is important to understand because I sometimes hear descriptions of it as something that would sort of bring intellectual property down or, or uh, would have far reaching consequences. It, it won't. It is a very, it is very limited in scope. It is clearly confined to COVID-19 prevention, containment and treatment. It is limited not only in scope, but also limited in duration for the duration of the, um, of the pandemic. Um, it was met initially by all high income countries with opposition. Um, that has changed for the United States. The United States has declared to support a TRIPS waiver, but for vaccines, not for other uh, products. The, the European Union does not. The European Union uh, prefers the use of compulsory licensing. That is something that in the past they have mostly opposed when countries used it, but they have uh, apparently uh, changed their mind and are now promoting the use of compulsory licensing in the context of COVID-19. Uh, of COVID When I say this, this all happens within the negotiations of the TRIPS Council. We, of course, do not know how the EU would respond if countries would actually start issuing compulsory licensing. Um, I should mention that has, it has already happened, uh, COVID-19 related compulsory licenses. So um, perhaps uh, the EU has indeed changed its, uh, its approach to this. We need production scale up. That, uh, that, million, that 11 billion uh, number is a projection. Uh, that is what is needed, but uh, we're, we're not there yet. And we won't get there if production capacity isn't scaled up. There is unused production capacity, but you cannot divorce the discussion about increasing production capacity from the discussion about the sharing of the know-how and the intellectual property and whatever else is necessary, because that is exactly what, what hampers the scaling up of the production capacity. The fastest way to have more production of regulated vaccines, so vaccines that, that today have regulatory approval or emergency regulatory approval, is through the transfer of the technology, including the necessary IP and the knowledge and the know-how. So a level of collaboration. It is more complex than uh, patent licensing or waiving of IP, because here we're not talking about small molecules. These are more complex technology and a level of collaboration is necessary. That of course is the prop proposition of the COVID-19 technology access pool. Um, of which I'm a, I'm a great supporter and I would really like to see that become a, um, a reality. So um, pandemic uh, on the pandemic treaty, the pandemic, the discussions on the pandemic treaty, first of all, um, the decision to negotiate a pandemic treaty has not been made. It was raised at the World Health Assembly earlier this year, but the decision is postponed until November. So in November, we will know whether a pandemic treaty negotiation will start. But let's assume that it, it will, considering how many fault lines have appeared in the unpreparedness of the world, I think having a better set of rules and regulate things up front so you don't have to sort them out in the middle of a global health crisis seems to me a very good idea, but we'll, we'll see in November whether, um, uh, whether the, co the collective uh, multilateral um, uh, leadership thinks so too. On access and innovation, so on issues related to intellectual property and technology transfer obligations, I would expect the pandemic treaty to, 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 to regulate these issues up front so that, as I said, we don't have to do that in the middle of a crisis. Uh, key elements for that would be commitments to public financing. We've seen the success of that. That would have to be, uh, it, it would be very good to sort of hardwire, hardwire that. 
but with that, there can also a mechanism for the sharing of that knowledge that is created with that, uh, with that public financing. We have agreements for the creation and the protection of private goods. We do not have agreements on the creation and the protection of global, global public goods. And I would hope that a future pandemic treaty uh, uh, would uh, would provide such a set of uh, such a set of rules because it would be in everyone's uh, interest. And uh, with that, I have come to the end of my time and the end of my presentation. Um, th I thank you for your attention and invite you to uh, to visit our website. We have a dedicated COVID page where you'll find uh, a lot more of our uh, of our information. Thank you. Over, Elena. So I think it's Dimitri it goes first, but I'm copy pasting the link of your COVID, it's the tools link in your site, uh, Ellen. So Dimitra. Okay, thank you, Elena. So uh, I would uh, I would like to go first. My question uh, is uh, if you think that uh, we uh, could, uh, uh, given our uh, experience in pandemics, uh, if we should discuss a differential form of waiver uh, in the general context of a future pandemic uh, treaty, or do you think that uh, the existent uh, procedure uh, of the waiver uh, as described in the current framework is effective and it's uh, enough? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, first of all, the waiver doesn't exist. What exists is the proposal and only recently um, a sort of lukewarm willingness to discuss it. That's where we are with the waiver after after months months after the the proposal uh, proposal was made. Um, the uh, if the waiver is adopted, and you you may have have understood from my presentation, I'm not the greatest uh, um, believer in the effectiveness of the waiver when it comes to vaccines and possibly other more complex technologies. What would be much, the waiver would be important um, for, for uh, other, uh, other technologies. And it would certainly be very effective uh, for therapeutics, uh, in particular for small molecules, but for the vaccines, you need to have that more active transfer of the technology directly. Now, if you would, regulate that up front. If you would say in a pandemic treaty, if X, Y, Z happens, there is A, the commitment for the financing and B, the commitment that that know-how NIP is shared through a pre-existing mechanism because the COVID-19 pool could continue to, uh, to exist or could transform into, a, a, into, into a whatever pool. Um, I think that that would be the most um, uh, most rapid way of dealing with it, because look at where we are now, um, so many months, well, more than a year, year and a half after, the, after the, the first outbreak, we knew the beginning that without doing something about increasing production capacity, we would be in this situation of inequitable distribution. Uh, and that is exactly what, uh, what has happened. So to have a mechanism to avoid that the next time around would, in my mind, be very important. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, Elena. Okay, so first of all to say, thanks, Ellen, very much for the comprehensive presentation. First of all to say that um, George touched upon a little bit on supplies. There's a lot of discussion on raw materials. And of course, if you discuss production of vaccines, not SMI is not well, even if you discuss mo uh, molecules, um, if you discuss uh, vaccine production, there's a lot of machinery and devices involved and know-how. So it's a complex, let's say, knowledge transfer scheme. But having said that, um, I'd like to, uh, to to ask a couple of things, Seven. First one, there was a development on uh, Friday, I think, with uh, SEPI Marketplace being uh, launched and COVAX involvement. And... This, of course, is something which is good news. Um, but in terms of affecting more permanent, more radical solutions, more effective solutions, do you think it moves us forward or is just putting back, if you like, a stop to a discussion on other means and measures rather than voluntary, if you like, efforts? And 
in terms of political willingness, there appears to be a lot of inactivity, let us say, uh, because you get to hear, we will discuss this, we are for this and so on. But um, you mentioned, and I've seen it mentioned in many places, this common good, global, global public health good and so on, but it's not really enshrined in law per se. And I hope Sujita will discuss a little bit more. So do you think we are moving to the right direction or do you think we're in a little bit of a standstill? Well, um, for the moment, not much is moving. Um, on the other hand, the political pressure, um, and that is a direct result of the discussions around the TRIPS waiver. So in, in that sense, it is a, a very important political process that generates a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of activity and might have the side effect that some of these other things are, are going to are going to happen. So th that that would be very important. The other very important element is the Delta variant and the prospect of of further variants and a growing realization that uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. So there is a self interest in doing things differently. Um, and I would like that to sink in more rapidly than it does. But I think now we're in wave. I've lost count of count of the wave. I, I, I carry a Dutch passport. My 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 country is is in an absolute uh, dreadful situation with 10,000 new cases uh, a day. And it's a small country with very few people. So that gives you some idea. Um, Perhaps that will also sort of refocus the attention that we need to do things differently. Um, the pandemic treaty, of course, if one gets it right, it will mostly bring benefits for the next pandemic. Um, and there is still an enormous amount to, to be done uh, in, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, your question on the CEPI marketplace, I think that is a particular mechanism to solve particular problems of, of supply, uh, but it's not an answer to uh, the need to, sh to transfer the technolog technology for, for vaccine production. Now, you often hear it's very lengthy, it's very complex, it's very complicated. A lot of things in life is complicated. Tying your shoelaces is very complicated. Making vaccines, yes, is very complicated, but it is absolutely doable. And if you study the timelines of the moment a license agreement is signed and the first delivery of a vaccine, if it is done with collaboration, that is around six months, which means if this had happened, the day the COVID-19 technology access pool was established, we would have had the production capacity today. Yeah, and, and this, I remember we were discussing exactly a year and a half ago with George, whether we can build capacity and he would say like in one or two years, I don't know if you remember this, George, we would say we need a couple of years, but here we are a couple of years later. Huh? So, okay, um, again, in the interest of time, but I want to circle back because in, in um, discussing R&D and discussing public spending and how we manage patterns and of course where does true innovation come from to say that in terms of incentivization we have not seen this approach work well for vaccines in the past or for AMR I mean corona is an exceptional case so uh, we can hopefully circle back to this in the end um, moving forward, I'd like to present Luke McDonough, and I, I'd like to say I'm pronouncing it correctly because apparently it's Irish, but please correct me if I'm wrong. You owe it to Dimitra, who did research on the pronunciation, because she thought she was presenting you. So uh, Luke is associate professor um, at, uh, sorry, assistant professor, sorry, assistant professor at LSE and a scholar in uh, intellectual property rights. I think with a much broader scope than what we're discussing today, also uh, trademarks and um, other types of intellectual property rights. And we were very pleasantly surprised to see uh, scholars in the, in the intellectual property coming together to formulate a statement. And I, I recommend, I will put it in the chat. I recommend everybody reads it because it's very straightforward and simple. Um, it's not an advocacy document, it's a technical document, but it's really simply written, although lawyers and doctors and scientists, we write complex sometimes. Um, so I'd like to kindly ask him to present and also please to mention what prompted it and how do you see this going forward? Thank you. Thank you, uh, 
Elena, and also, you know, it's, it's a great privilege to be on this panel with people like George and Ellen and Su Sujitha and, um, you know, I, I obviously favor the waiver and I'm one of the co-authors of, of an open letter that has been published last week with um, over 120 sign signatories, mostly professors of IP law at places as far as flung as Oxford to Cape Town to Delhi to Guatemala to Brazil. Um, so, you know, th th there's a kind of a global network of IP scholars that, that I and my co-authors are in contact with. And so um, we're obviously very interested in this topic. It's probably the first time since the HIV AIDS crisis that intellectual property has been thrust into the public domain in such a massive and important way. And so we were motivated as scholars to respond because we felt we had a duty to, because this is our subject, this is the nature of our expertise. And we felt that some of the commentaries that were coming out maybe didn't reflect some of the uh, the nuances of, of, of the debate and some of the historical um, uh, points. and. I mean, Ellen has already made some really important points about practicalities. Um, I'm going to focus my first point on, um, you know, this idea of the incentive argument and the idea that, that the waiver might might negatively impact upon incentives for innovation. And um, obviously, we've heard George make this argument. We hear this from time to time from various others. Um, you know. Uh, uh, all of us ha have a stake in, in, in getting to a solution here. And I certainly don't think that anybody who disagrees with the waiver is, is necessarily um, an opponent of a solution. You know, and obviously someone like George who works in this area has a huge amount of scientific knowledge. But when you look at intellectual property, um, there is an interesting historical development that is really worth referring back to. And it's that uh, countries tend to support international IP only when they become exporters of IP. And so if you look back through history, you know, for example, Ellen's country, the, the Netherlands has abolished the entire patent system at various points to help boost um, copying innovation, the building up of industrial capacity. So it, it is certainly not true that IP always incentivizes innovation. And we see that in, you know, that historical example of the Netherlands at the end of the 19th century, you know, Germany did not protect pharmaceutical patents until, well, this is West Germany, until 1968, Switzerland until 1977, Japan until 1976, Spain until 1992, India and Brazil, the two countries in the global south that have the best capacity, didn't protect patents from the late 60s up until the TRIPS agreement. And they built up their capacity in, in that way. And so um, there are times at which copying is easier and more cost effective in the building up of your own capacity when you don't protect strong IP rights. And that's one of the reasons why the, the TRIPS agreement is controversial um, and has always been, because it was sold to, to, to developing countries with the promise that in return for protecting the IP rights, which tend to benefit the exporter countries in the global north, the global south was meant to get technology transfer as a result. And what we've seen over the last 20 years as George alluded to a little bit, is that that has been much slower than promised and it hasn't been sufficient. And so when a crisis like this happens, you know, it's only in a crisis that you begin to see how these agreements have worked and, and where they haven't. You know, the fact that, that um, Africa has so little manuf manufacturing of vaccines is a clear problem and a failure of the TRIPS agreement because we would have expected more tech transfer by now. But it is also noticeable that there are some successes. Um, for example, South Africa does actually produce some of its own antiretroviral drugs through Aspen. There's also the partnership CIPLA, the India-Uganda South Africa partnership. So there is some capacity in a country like South Africa. Um, and that is, is important to know. And one of the, the, the important things about the Doha Declaration, about the HIV debate, was that it, it led to the Global South having a much larger measure of control over production of generic HIV drugs, because it's only through that that you can actually get to equal distribution. So, you know, I have utmost, utmost respect for, for, for George and his scientific expertise, you know, it's far more about 
a lot of this than I do, but I don't agree with him that um, we need to just let the global north producers do their thing. I think that the way out of this is to have um, distributed manufacturing hubs in the global south, South Africa being one country where you, you can imagine that happening. There's already, obviously in India, the serum uh, AstraZeneca agreement is very successful. Um, the AstraZeneca agreement with Fiat Cruz in Brazil has been much, much slower, much less uh, successful at producing doses. The AstraZeneca um, bilateral agreement with Thailand, with Siam, has been uh, pretty disastrous in many respects. I mean, there was an FT article on, on a couple of weeks ago about how corrupt the whole thing has become. It's probably not AstraZeneca's fault. The company is owned by the king of Thailand and the whole thing has become mired in controversy. Um, but it's an example of the fact that bilateral, uh, uh, closed bilateral agreements are not always the best way to share knowledge. And it is very disappointing, I must say, that no companies have joined CTAP, as Ellen said. You know, had they done so 18 months ago, we would be in a much better position than now. And this proposition by India and South Africa um, to waive the international IP obligations under the TRIPS agreement does not come out of nowhere. It, you know, if you look at October 2020, when this proposal was first made, at the same time as that, there was a report by Human Rights Watch that predicted that sharing of vaccines would be a problem, predicted that the global south would be abandoned essentially to its fate without even vaccines for healthcare workers as the WHO had recommended. So, you know, for me, yes, it is amazing that we have these vaccines. It is amazing that we've um, produced 3 billion. Um, but for me, it's 50% an amazing success and 50% a complete um, inhuman disaster. And it's that second part that um, we need to, to address. And uh, in, in the open letter and in the longer academic article, we talk about how the waiver goes some way to addressing this. It's not just about patents. It's also about the sharing of trade secrets, regulatory data, know-how, and so on. And, um, you know, ideally we would get there through voluntary solutions. But we have to admit that these so far have really let down the global south. And it is uh, entirely uh, logical that in response to that, they would call for a waiver of it, in the international obligations. Um, and it, it's worth pointing out that particularly in vaccines, um, the, the, the idea that patents create um, a kind of superb incentive for the development of vaccines really does have to be questioned. Because again, if you go back through the history of this, um, vaccine development has often been publicly funded as it was in this crisis. And, you know, Georgia's own institution, the National Institutes of Health is an amazing institution. It's a public institution. Oxford University is a public institution. So, you know, a a as humanity, we rely on public institutions and public funding for a huge amount of our vaccine research because um, pharmaceutical companies don't generally pump money into it. It is an area where you might consider it to be an area of market failure. And so I'm not concerned that the waiver would create this negative uh, incentive um, or this problematic uh, precedent that would, that would negatively affect innovation in the future, because we already rely on the public for that. And in my view, we should be looking to learn from this crisis at how we have um, succeeded in many respects at bringing public and private together. You know, one of the key MNRA vaccine patents comes from the National Institute of Health and is used by Moderna, for example, in their technology. So, you know, we have um, a certain amount of sharing happening, but it's simply not enough. And uh, we have to uh, think about, I mean, it, it, you know, another point that George made, uh, again, is that there's a concern that if we share knowledge too much, that, you know, Russia and China will, will kind of uh, get rich at the expense of, of, of the West. And, you know, Again, this is not an, an argument that I really b believe in. I mean, for one thing, BioNTech has a separate agreement with Fosun in Shanghai, and there's already technology transfer of the mRNA vaccines going, going on there. So China already has this technology or will do very soon and is developing its own mRNA vaccines. Thailand is doing the same. Um, you know, intellectual property is not just about providing a reward for uh, inventors. It's also a means of creating artificial scarcity in a market in order to do that. And we have to question whether we want to create artificial scarcity in, in a time of a pandemic. Um, and, you know, 
at the moment, uh, it's unclear whether we can trust the, the, the market to even produce enough vaccines um, by the end of this year. You know, the IMF and Nature have predicted we may get to 6 billion vaccines if we go on as we are. Obviously, the, the, the Air Affinity, which presented to the WTO recently, is predicting more like 10 billion, which would obviously be great if, if, we, if we got that. But the other problem is distribution. And this is why you need uh, hubs in the Global South producing the vaccines, because the Global South cannot trust the Global North on distribution. Pfizer is already going to the FDA to push third doses. Israel is already giving third doses to its citizens. Um, you know, and when you think about the amount of doses that have been wasted, particularly in the United States, have been allowed to expire. Um, you know, even if we get to the 10 billion, how much will actually be available and be made available to the global south? You know, COVAX was promised 2 billion doses this year. We're more than halfway through the year. They've delivered only 100 million. So, you know, we need to think radically here and we need to rethink some of the, the assumptions that are not always so reliable, actually, if you unpack them, as I said. And as my final point, any pandemic treaty, as Ellen said, must address questions of intellectual property. And it must do so because this is about power. Who has the power to facilitate production of these vaccines? We know that offers by companies like Teva in, in Israel, BioLice in Canada, Incepta in Bangladesh, Bavaria in Nordic in Denmark have been refused. They've sought licenses to boost production and they've been turned down. So we know that this is about power and we need to distribute some of that power to the global South, just like after the HIV AIDS crisis um, erupted in South Africa, it became more easy for the global South to trade between itself with respect to to vaccines. So I'll conclude there and uh, let the, the rest of the speakers uh, come in. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Lou. So there are too many points. Very, very quickly to say, I do not know if you managed to see what we did last time, which is 10, 10 days ago, roughly two weeks ago. Um, for us in public health, more close to health economics, doing a patent, restricting, if you like, uh, is restricting access. It's an artificial instrument. Um, because you, you know, in this case, you had infinite demand. So why would you need such an instrument? Uh, but there were many people discussing incentivization. And of course, um, the question that arose in, in many our minds, but it's not discussed at all, is whether the people making the decisions, which be C-suite, corporate people and so on, have re any real touch other than some stakeholder meetings with the investors, which are hedge funds and trusts and so on. And of course, uh, let's say family-owned business may very well aim to have long-term uh, profit and be very willing um, to boost the market, whereas uh, a CEO may be very willing to have maximum profit for a couple of years, maximum four or five years, because this is his own, if you like, in quotation marks, turnover. And then, of course, um, we had some uh, events. I think it was Sujita in a, in a brief discussion we were having last week that mentioned, and uh, why do we have... Uh, COVID shield and uh, Vaxavir, which is the same basically vaccine, it's the AstraZeneca vaccine, accepted for vaccination certification in Europe, but not abroad. There could be valid reasons for qualifying sites. And at the moment, we haven't seen, even within Europe, if you look at the newly qualified in quotation mark sites and forget about global site, south, you see that we have a European south, if you like, so the, and, and Balkans and so on. There are very few countries that are doing R&D, maybe a couple, and there are very few countries that are doing production at the moment. So this dynamic is continuing. So I have, I think, two questions for you, if I may. The first one is about de-risking. Uh, in the history of patents, and of course, people think accountability and, and uh, you know, um, transnational companies are very recent, but they go back to West Indies companies and three, four centuries ago. So the first question is, do you see um, any particular uh, risk in actually introducing, going forward with a waiver? Do you see there's a concrete risk, but we will lose uh, investment uh, from the private sector? And the second one is, if we forget for one second for um, coronavirus and we forget about the vaccines, what do other experiences in terms of abuse of dominant position teach us? We've seen lots of interesting things happening in the UK in the last few uh, weeks, I think, uh, with NHS buttons and so on. So what, do we, what lessons do we have in terms of behavior? 
from the industry. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Both great questions. Um, I mean, I think on the, on the first question, we have to, all of us have to admit that no major governmental decision here is without risk. That's absolutely true. Um, but there's risks in doing nothing. I mean, I often talk to opponents of the waiver. I think it's really important that we keep dialogue open with people who don't agree with us. And, uh, you know, one of the points that, I, you know, when they say to, to me, you know, how will the waiver work? How will you get sharing of trade secrets? What happens if the companies refuse and all this? You know, there are all these complicated questions that we go into it, it, in our long paper in, in, in some detail. But I, I often turn it back to them, which is what is the risk of, of going on as we are? What is the risk of the status quo? It's very, very clear that there's a massive risk to the global south of going on as we are because um, patents and kind of this idea of hoarding knowledge. You know, if, if we can argue that countries have hoarded doses, I think it's fair to say that companies are hoarding knowledge. And if companies hoard knowledge, that creates a massive risk for the global south. And one of the perverse incentives of being, you know, a CEO at Pfizer or one of these major companies is that, you know, they're on record as saying they want to charge $150 for booster doses, if not this year, then next year. Now, if you have limited production and there will always be limited production we'll never have unlimited production so you know we'll always have limited production to some extent what do you do as a ceo do you prioritize selling high priced booster doses to the west or do you prioritize lower cost first doses to the the developing world so there's a perverse incentive in that the power of the, of, of the ip gives to that ceo or that company and it can lead them to make decisions that as you say are not good behavior we would not consider that to be globally normatively a a, a, a good thing so governments have to play a role here the waiver is one aspect of that it's not the only solution it's not a panacea but it is one way to direct companies towards sharing and i'm heartened by the fact that the threat of the waiver rather than creating let's say a lack of investment or anything like that the threat of the waiver is bringing companies to the table we're seeing johnson and johnson coming to an agreement uh, negotiated with the president of south africa and aspen to, to manufacture the entirety of the vaccine, not just fill and finish in South Africa. Um, we're seeing BioNTech discussing, though they've only made vague promises so far about setting up a hub in Africa. So, so far, you know, the, the people who six months ago were saying, if we even discuss the waiver seriously, it will be, you know, the end of civilization as we know it. It will kill all investment in, in uh, pharmaceuticals and in health innovation. It hasn't, hasn't played out that way. And it didn't play out that way at the time of the HIV AIDS uh, crisis either. So, you know, sometimes these arguments are made, you know, a little bit self-servingly by, by co private companies. And we can't just focus on one risk of, let's say the waiver being granted. We have to look, look at the total risk. And right now the virus is running rampant because we don't have enough production of vaccines and we have unequal distribution. So addressing those issues has to be uh, the, the way to go. And I would prefer to see it done voluntarily because it will be quicker than if we have to go through the waiver. But in the absence of companies going, you know, making enough bilateral agreements or joining CTAP, what choice do we have? We cannot go on with the status quo. Thank you very much. Yeah, the um, voluntary, nobody doubts voluntary is faster, uh, but it, indeed it was not happening until the ball got rolling with the discussion or debate on the waiver. Um, I think Dimitri, because his texting has a question for you. Uh, yes, yeah? thank you. Yes, thank you, Elena. I would like to uh, to ask uh, a short question. Uh, in the field of uh, distribution, uh, do you see a role for international organizations? Uh, thank you. Uh, ideally, yes. Uh, I mean, you should, you know, the, the WHO has the expertise here. So ideally, they would be, in a way, in charge of distribution. And they recommended that, you know, if we were going to look at this as a global public good and not as a commodity, what would have happened is that healthcare workers across the world would have been the first to get the vaccine. I mean, last month, more than a dozen Ugandan doctors died from, from COVID. And, you know, in a developing country, losing healthcare workers is a much bigger disaster than it is in the ritual, as, as terrible as it is. And my own sister in Ireland is a healthcare worker, so I have a huge amount of, of time for them wherever uh, they are in the world. But we have to accept that, it, that it's far more difficult to replace healthcare workers in the global south than it is in, in, in the rich north. And so, 
the fact that, that didn't happen is a colossal global failure. And there's no excuse for that because it wouldn't have even been that many doses. And when you think of you know, the fact that um, Canada, the UK, the US, the amount of doses that they're hoarding and they're only now beginning to distribute out, sometimes at the point of almost expiry, it really isn't good enough. So, you know, we need a better solution. Um, we need more power to co countries that otherwise don't have it with regard to, to distribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Elena. No, I think it's back to you because it's okay. Sujita. It's Sujita next, and yes, then we can we have perhaps a little bit of time for everybody. Okay. No, we've touched on too many topics. Okay, we we'll see more questions later on. So, so yes, let me introduce uh, to the audience uh, Dr. Sujita uh, Sabramanian, who is a senior uh, lecturer in law at the School of Law and Social Justice of the Liverpool University. Her main uh, research uh, interest includes uh, global governance um, relating to IP law, focusing mainly on pharmaceuticals and green technologies. She's also interested in, co uh, in constitutional law, particularly in uh, uh, constitutional morality. That being said, uh, Dr. Uh, Sabramanian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you very much, Demetra and Elena. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, on this panel. Uh, I think the problem uh, with being the last person on the panel is that uh, many of your points are already spoken by the people before you. So in a way, I think Ellen has covered a lot of the things that I was um, planning to say. And uh, uh, Luke mentioned some bits as well. So there we go. Uh, I'm going to kind of try and navigate around it and recreate my structure of what I was going to say and touch upon some of the things that have not been touched upon so as to give it a kind of a more broader um, uh, discussion. So um, I think I want to sort of uh, for us for a minute to step back and evaluate how we have actually dealt with the pandemic since since the beginning and just a couple of issues just to uh, raise um, uh, um, an awareness which I think everyone is aware of anyway but you know just to highlight it anyway so if we recall way back in April uh, 2022. This is at the height of the uh, initial lockdown and so on. Uh, we had the Interior Minister for Berlin, um, Andreas Geisel, accusing the United States of modern piracy um, after they were reportedly diverting a shipment of masks, which was intended for the German police, were um, shipped back to the United States. So, and they were basically calling for um, uh, the, the German government to ask the United States to confirm to international trading rules and not use uh, Wild West methods in the face of a global crisis. So we see that, in fact, uh, since then, both the Trump administration at the beginning of the pandemic and now the current Biden administration have more recently um, uh, in, uh, clarified that they will be invoking the Defense Production Act to address domestic essential goods and material shortages, uh, which is caused by the pandemic. So basically, this is an act which um, confers on the president a broad set of powers to mobilize the resources and production of um, uh, domestic uh, private companies to meet key uh, national security and defense um, uh, needs. And it also allows the president to reorient the nation's uh, domestic manufacturing and production capabilities to ensure that um, companies prioritize and fulfill the contracts which is necessary to address the nation's needs. Similarly, if you see in the UK, uh, though the Johnson government was uh, initially quite slow um, to respond to the pandemic, and, and not just initially, but various junctures actually, um, uh, which resulted in magnifying the impact of the pandemic, um, the uh, uh, approval of the uh, uh, the regulatory approval of the vaccine and its rollout uh, in the UK um, is considered to be of some success in comparison to um, the other European nations which had lagged behind uh, in the initial period. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, that. Uh, but we know that uh, the lackluster fun funless lack of funless uh, uh, day that is today, the 19th of July, the so-called Freedom Day, 
um, uh, where the, we were not really having the fun that we expected to have on this Freedom Day, uh, shows us that despite the fact that much of our population is double vaccinated, um, we are not really out of the crisis as uh, George had indicated because we have obviously more and more variants coming into the picture, which has um, clarified to the uh, wealthier nations, as uh, Ellen had pointed out, the self self-serving interest, wherein that unless the health of all is taken into account, uh, the health of, uh, uh, we are not really out of the crisis. So obviously it's it's not simply a case of ensuring that your own population is vaccinated, but it's also a case of ensuring that the rest of the world is also vaccinated. Um, and that it, it, simply by diverting the vaccines and ensuring that there is only enough supply for your own population is not going to be good enough. So it's within this context that uh, um, uh, we address the issue of, for instance, uh, various uh, health governance um, uh, bodies uh, um, uh, and also um, multilateral trade um, regimes, which have utterly failed in trying to ensure very quick responses to a pandemic um, of this magnitude. Uh, and, and, and that is pretty much uh, clear. So. Um, the question then is, I mean, we are now talking about IP waiver, we're talking about a global pandemic treaty, we are talking about, you know, um, putting uh, in place new mechanisms to deal with a pandemic such as this and so on and so forth. So does it mean that the uh, current measures, regulations, mechanisms that we have in place or have been inadequate? to deal with a pandemic of this severity. Is that the case? So if we were to look at, for instance, um, uh, so something like the global pandemic treaty that we are proposing, um, the current version of it is the, um, the International Health Regulation. I think it's called the WHO's, um, uh, which works under the uh, auspices of the WHO. That uh, has two key roles. You detect, uh, you alert other nations about a pandemic and you ensure that there is uh, uh, this um, uh, a way to um, put together health technologies that can act as a countermeasure to deal with uh, these, these sort of uh, uh, health issues or health pandemics. Now, in that specific role, it has the, 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 the mechanism is already in place. It's not as if we don't have, we are, we are working on a vacuum. The, the, what we are talking about in terms of the global pandemic treaty, we already have in the form of the international health regulation. Similarly, when we're talking about IP waiver, we're talking about you know, uh, uh, ways in which we need to deal with intellectual property and so on and so forth. Those are already addressed as part of um, the flexibilities in the uh, WTO's TRIPS, TRIPS agreement as have, we have been mentioning. So if we already have these mechanisms in place, um, then, you know, every time we have a new pandemic or a new issue, we come up with, and that is my criticism here, uh, in relation, for instance, uh, an example I'm taking of, is the IP waiver, which, uh, which Luke so passionately talked about. Normatively, I'm in agreement with the idea of an IP waiver. Um, uh, I think it is a brilliant idea that... Um, uh, uh, we should ensure that there should be a waiving of technologies, especially when much of these technologies are funded, as Ellen pointed out, um, by uh, public funds. Uh, so that being the case, why is it that in the face of an unprecedented epidemic, normally when we're talking about epidemics, and this is the reason, one of the reasons which have been pointed out um, in some of the literature uh, as to why we have struggle to sort of cope immediately and quickly with this pandemic is that normally the pandemics have been seen as the epicenter of pandemics in the last century or in the last uh, few decades have been seen not to be uh, occurring somewhere in the global north. It is seen as something which is taking place because of governance issues in um, global south countries and so on and so forth. So this is not something that we expected uh, 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 to hit the global north countries to an extent that it has hit uh, us uh, now and therefore suddenly we are uh, trying to see how we can protect ourselves, and, 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 and suddenly we find out that we're protecting ourselves is not just sufficient. We need to protect everyone else in order that we can uh, still ensure that our population is uh, uh, protected from the variants. Um, so uh, uh, the problem with um, uh, things like the IP waiver uh, 
I find is not that it will stop investment and it will stop in incentives and so on and so forth. I totally reject that argument uh, just as Luke has done and as uh, and Ellen has done and, and so on. Uh, uh, the, the problem I find is that we are simply creating another a Band-Aid. And uh, by, by sorting out another Band-Aid, we are refusing or failing to look at the key problems which we have, which, uh, we have been uh, um, facing for quite a while. Uh, if we look at, for instance, the HIV, um, uh, the way in which we dealt with HIV, for instance, tens of millions of uh, people died before we actually set, put anything in place at all. Um, and, uh, and that too, at, at, uh, when, the Af when the South African government had filed a case state that they were going to use the competition law provisions. Um, this is a, it is at this point that um, the uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, came to heel and uh, immediately put forward uh, solutions uh, voluntarily. So this is another problem with this voluntary uh, licensing agreements and so on and so forth. I mean, now that there is a pandemic uh, of this magnitude, obviously uh, uh, there is it's it's uh, impossible. Um, that compulsory licensing provisions could not have uh, come into effect at all. Um, um, so if those provisions were taken into account, obviously that would have worked. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the WTO uh, dispute settlement body and the appellate body and so on and so forth, they have uh, shown quite recently in a couple of the cases that we noticed, uh, for instance, the tobacco plain packaging case, the asbestos case and so on and so forth, that uh, the, the, they are willing to take into account public uh, health issues uh, in um, uh, or preference public health issues uh, 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 instead of intellectual property issues where necessary. So in the case of a pandemic, cl quite clearly, uh, it would have been possible for us to preference public health issues in favor of, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, not in favor of intellectual property issues. So why is it that we are falling back into the trap uh, uh, of uh, creating these alternative small solutions. Um, with, I mean, for instance, the IP waiver is, is only for three years. We are saying effectively for three years, it's a very limited waiver. Uh, what you're asking, the, the, the specificities of the waiver is very, very limited because originally when the IP waiver uh, proposal was submitted by South Africa and India in uh, October 2020, it was a much more broad proposal. But now because of the various questions that has been put to South Africa and, in, and India and the other supporting countries for this waiver, the, 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 the latest uh, uh, IP waiver um, a proposal is very, very limited. So they're asking for very limited and for a specific number of years, a specific kind of waiver and so on and so forth. So to me, I find that uh, my criticism against waiver, for instance, is that we are, uh, we are creating, um, um, we're not really creating long-term solutions um, by looking towards short-term um, uh, issues. So that, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm saying that, oh, we need to uh, um, not, not address the problems which the current pandemic has thrown at us. Obviously, we need to address it. And, and what I'm saying is it has shown to us over and over again, it has shown to us that um, uh, the current mechanisms are not in place to actually uh, work and function the way we have set it out uh, 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 to function. Um, so, um, for instance, um, uh, one, one, uh, um, the global pandemic treaty, for instance, just, just quickly to address that. So for instance, Ellen was mentioning that a global pandemic treaty must have must address issues of intellectual property rights. Uh, we should talk about health technologies in relation to that. Well, yes, of course, uh, that is what we would advocate. And I agree completely with it. But will that happen? I mean, okay, this is supposed to happen sometime in November. And my guess, my very cynical uh, view would be that uh, intellectual property would not actually uh, uh, take a place like we hope for it to um, in, in the global pandemic treaty. Why is that? How is that? Uh, and, and a very good example for that is if you look at the, for instance, the climate uh, climate change uh, treaties. If you look at the climate change treaties, repeatedly uh, we find that in the uh, 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 conferences, uh, COPs, um, we uh, talk about the issue of uh, intellectual property actually being a barrier to climate technologies, green technologies, um, and uh, the lack of uh, uh, technology transfer in relation to green technologies. Um, repeatedly that comes uh, um, 
into the discussion and very quickly and easily it is squashed down. Uh, it's, it never has ever uh, taken a very, very prominent place as it should, uh, considering that uh, climate change is also a very similar threat to the pandemic that we are facing in that it is global, in that it affects everyone, in that it affects uh, you know um, um, people in, in very, very equal terms and there is no escape for anyone, um, uh, no matter how privileged you are. Um, so, uh, so in, in that sense, um, I doubt, I'm very, very cynical about the issue of intellectual property actually uh, forming, um, though I'm, I'm not against advocating it, of course, uh, I'm very much for advocating it, but I'm very cynical to actually see its presence in the Global Pandemic Treaty. So my view is that instead of um, uh, looking for a different treaty and hoping that a future pandemics will suddenly be, be dealt with in a much more uh, spectacularly different way because we have a new treaty to deal with it. Um, I, I, um, uh, I, my, my view is that we need to stick to what we have. We need to expand on what we already have, and we need to address the the uh, the reasons why many of these uh, issues are failing. And of course, we can look into uh, individual uh, issues to address them, but then I'm, I'm not sure whether we have uh, sufficient time. I'm happy to take it in, in the form of questions and so on and so forth. Now, one final point I want to make is about um, uh, um, the question of human security, collective security. So generally the United Nations uh, Security Council uh, deals with the issue of collective security only in times of war and peace. So effectively it states that if, it, if, some, if um, there is a threat to peace and security for one nation, you, you kind of treat it like it's a threat to peace and security for every other nation. Therefore, everyone collects together to try and uh, uh, deal with this uh, threat in a very collective way. Now, the uh, definition for um, collective security has expanded a little bit, especially uh, in the face of Ebola, for instance, wherein they were willing to consider the issue of Ebola as a human security issue um, to try and address um, um, uh, the Ebola pandemic also through the UN Security Council Forum. But once again, what we see in the case of the pandemic, um, the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, which actually had affected a, a, a broader uh, number of countries and people and so on and so forth, is that the way in which the United Nations Security Council could deal with um, the human security issue um, uh, for COVID-19 pandemic, the resolutions that has come out in relation to that is much more minimized in comparison to that we see for Ebola. Uh, and why is that? And that is also because of um, the um, geopolitical issues between United States and uh, China, uh, because of which they could not come into some sort of an agreement as to what they need to um, agree on in relation to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, how they should address it and so on and so forth. So what we're seeing here is that there is a lot of geo geopolitical issues that have come into the fray just as in the past, um, and uh, the much of the problems that we are uh, dealing with at the moment, uh, in um, uh, in terms of the failure um, um, about the, um, uh, the of the mechanisms in relation to the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, is to a large extent because of. Um, uh, issues that need to have been addressed at its roots instead of trying to create uh, further and new uh, mechanisms, measures, regulations, and uh, legislations. Um, my one final, final point before I go um, uh, um, or stop at this moment is, is um, uh, that I would encourage uh, people to look at um, uh, um, a a policy document that was actually proposed by the uh, the Labour Party in the um, previous general election in relation to um, um, medicines. I think the, the document was called Medicines for All uh, or Medicines for the Many. For, um, uh, and basically what they had set out was to show that the current uh, system um, doesn't seem to work very well considering the amount of public funds that go into creating much of these uh, medicines. And uh, given that the government is putting in so much money, uh, for instance, for the AstraZeneca, uh, the government had put in one billion, um, as, as Ellen pointed out in the case of Pfizer, there was uh, half a billion and so on and so forth. Overall, around 93 billion has been spent. Now, given that public funds goes into creating these uh, vaccines, these health technologies, and so on and so forth. Um, 
it why is it that there is a privatization of profits while socialization of cost happens so we are we are so paying Kipa, sorry to to interrupt uh, we are a little bit uh, uh, run uh, out, out of time, time. Okay. in order to have some questions perhaps okay i'll just finish Could the you... sentence and thank i will you. be thank done you with you it. So yes much. no problem um so we have uh, so effectively the the government is funding the medicines the government is funding the risk i mean okay only for this pandemic because given its unprecedented nature uh, but government is funding also the purchase of these medicines from these private companies so the profit seems to be held by the private companies the cost and uh, uh, associated with it is held, uh, is taken by the public and i think that needs to be addressed and what the, uh, what the uh, policy document had mentioned was that we need to bring together uh, a government funded research and development uh, body which can actually have its own patents which it uh, makes available to the rest of the population or to other countries uh, for a much um, um, smaller price for instance so i'll stop at this point and then yeah thank you thank you so much for this so interesting uh, presentation about uh, and for highlighting the, uh, the existence of remedies and uh, tools it was very interesting i don't know if we have time for questions or if i can no, we, we don't but but okay. i think i will go back to george i mean we can do a quick recap look hard to go because we are way over time already but um uh, I, I will sort of uh, uh, I will I will I will be a little bit provocative. I don't know if you remember last year, George, with Remdesivir, we had some discussion on how the trial was set up and so on. And then they got orphan designation for uh, grounds which is you know it could not be substantiated. And then there was an outcry. And then within days, Gilead rescinded. Uh, you know the FDA had granted it. And the, the company actually sort of withdrew that the request for orphan designation. Um, and market exclusivities, we didn't really discuss so much in this particular panel, but it's a, it's a broader discussion. So look, touched upon some of the points you mentioned. Do you want to counter? Because I think you're not against these things. You just want a temporal, if you like, order, some order in time on how we approach the topic. You are muted, Professor Pavlakis. If you can unmute. Uh, I hope that helps. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Too bad that Luke is not with us uh, because uh, he raised uh, a number of excellent points. We are and, recording. Uh, we are recording and we'll all be on emails. Yeah, yeah. So the, the thing is, uh, I just uh, triggered by some of his excellent points to make the point that although we do live in a global village and uh, I'm affected uh, probably within days or weeks from uh, a virus that grows in Uganda, um, our ability to apply even existing international laws that we have agreed upon um, is limited to, to say the least. And uh, what I mean is that the international affairs are uh, affected and indeed regulated by the imposing power of strong states. So it's everybody for themselves. We have to recognize that despite our international organizations, etc. It's only recently that we even managed to prosecute some people for war crimes against humanity. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, the unification of the world in a global village uh, 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 is much faster than our ability to comprehend and impose um, new rules and new international situations. Um, and I think that this is, is this is reflected also, obviously, in the in international trade. So as Luke said, um, the states that they don't like the status quo, um, they make their own rules sometimes. And uh, the trend uh, with the um, uh, WTO, the World Trade Organization, was um, to have kind of uh, more, uh, more and more expanding iron rules that reflect the international necessities. Of course, they are imposed by the strongest, and uh, the arguments uh, that are made is that uh, in the long run, 
we have to find something that serves the entire humanity. I think this is the big picture as much as I can see. Now, also, I, I want to make sure, uh, of course, I do not agree with uh, everything that I mentioned in, in, in my statements as arguments against, um, um, the, 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 you know, that we, we definitely need to improve the current situation. It's obvious. Uh, the question is how and how not to interrupt the good things that exist. So, for example, uh, my study, from whatever I understand, is that I know that after the, the last uh, many, many years, uh, you can say that the American public, by paying extravagant prices uh, for medicines, has subsidized a lot of uh, develop new developments for the entire world. And at the end, after years and after lots of profits, um, uh, many of these things become um, uh, the properties of the entire world. It's not perfect, but it's working. So for example, we have now an explosion in cancer therapeutics, and a lot of that is um, supported tremendously by private investment. Now, can it be done differently? Yes. Like in the case of, um, of uh, 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 COVID and uh, uh, the pandemic, we know that uh, people mentioned the 90 plus billions of uh, public investment and probably it's much more if you, if you count everything. Um, but I don't see the same urgency for other sectors. So I think that uh, the private sector, the way that has developed, in the uh, Western world, uh, world and, and many other places now, it has a lot to offer because it provides um, flexible uh, investment and financing, expecting profits. So um, before we change this model, we have to make sure that, uh, for example, the governments will step in with the same eagerness that uh, they showed at the beginning of the pandemic and make this public investment. In my opinion, I don't think that it's gonna happen everywhere. Now, uh, what I see is that the governments uh, for vaccines, for example, um, and, and some rare diseases, and uh, uh, Elena mentioned uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the travesty of remdesivir, becoming, uh, a, you know, a, an exclusive uh, seven-year um, uh, market drug uh, through this mechanism. But governments find the necessity to provide even more privileges to companies, um, uh, like for vaccines, they indemnify in America, as you know, um, they, uh, the, the vaccine manufacturers, um, from um, uh, lawsuits uh, against them. So the, the, the public pays for any problems or vaccines. And the, the reason was that, that because the vaccines uh, traditionally had low profits, that um, the private companies would not invest in this sector. And um, the, um, uh, the seven year exclusivity that was mentioned is actually another measure to uh, incentivize companies to invest in rare diseases, where um, it's very difficult to think about uh, commercially how to, um, to get back your investment. So um, there is a system uh, that works with market, uh, um, uh, you know, incentives, the way that it works. We have to think of how to improve and build on it uh, before we make uh, very dra drastic changes. And to say that intellectual property is a lot of things from the moment that uh, we accept to protect uh, Coca-Cola and uh, trademarks and uh, movie and, and music, etc. We have to really think that uh, uh, there should be uh, equal or stronger in, uh, treatment of how to uh, think about intellectual property in very key industries. Of course, 
we have to disseminate it for the whole humanity, but I think that this is a long-term goal. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think, although we are way of time in fairness, and uh, I had a lot of questions also for Sujita and so on, but we can address them perhaps by email. Perhaps, Dimitra, if we had, starting from Sujita and then going to Helen, if we have one final statement from, from all of you on what you think is the most relevant step at the moment in terms of dialogue and what we should all be engaging in the public health community and whether you see uh, any, uh, let us say, critical moment, critical event coming up to determine how we proceed in terms of the pandemic treaty. So um, we start perhaps with Sujita. Yeah, so um, my- we, we need to keep it, just to yeah. say, let's keep it at one minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. So my view would be that we need to create a, some sort of a, a, a very clear governments which are funding, providing public funds um, to uh, the private sector for the creation of various types of medicines and health technologies must keep a, a database um, so they know what exactly has come out of their funding, the output that has come out of it. Uh, any of the patents that come out of this public funding must be shared with the government right away. So the government always has um, uh, some sort of a non-exclusionary license, for instance. I mean, they could use it as crown use anyway, but they must be able to pass it on to anyone else if necessary. Um, therefore, um, the there must be, I mean, my view would be yes, uh, to create a database to ensure that public funds are not privatized. That Thank would be you my very one much. Minute. Yeah, and, and okay, in, in, in those saying, of course, that there should be some profit or, or some reward to EU and US patents, one can argue that the sequences came from Asia. But thank you very much. And then perhaps Ellen. Uh, I can be very brief. I fully agree with Suchita. Um, where I where I do not agree with her is that I tend to be more optimistic, and that's perhaps because I've been involved in a number of initiatives where I was always told, "You're crazy. This will never work. This will never happen." Um, and but some of them actually did. So I think we need to keep the hope, but work very hard to make sure that pandemic treaty or further agreements have a high degree of uh, of ambition. Over. Thanks. No, but what she said. You, Ellen. <laughs> no, but what she said in terms of liberation is easier because we all have a short-term memory. I think there are at least three or four examples this year similar to them this year. So you can see very strange behavior from regulatory bodies or governments having one thing in policy and writing, doing another thing in the field. So some sort of multilateral, interdisciplinary, maybe even think that monitoring what would be very nice to have. Um, and I know you're doing a lot in, the, uh, in, in your own entity, Ellen, but perhaps there's some room there for more multidisciplinary collaboration. And then Dimitra is on to you to conclude. And just to say, we did record this because we couldn't live stream. There was not enough time to disseminate and we will merge it with the previous one and hopefully uh, send text capturing what we discussed briefly for all of you to review. So Dimitra. Yes, uh, I think we, we heard some very interesting presentations. And I think that we all agree that uh, this is a global problem. And uh, of course, we need the rapid solutions. Uh, some of us uh, are more optimistic, some others are not so optimistic, op optimistic but uh, I, I believe that we can combine, uh, let's say, all the tools, existing tools, with a new one, new ones uh, which are adapted to the pandemic situation. And that being said, back to you, Elena. Uh, thank you, thanks very much for sticking around 20 minutes over time. Have a lovely, uh, I don't know, rest of the evening, rest of the day, rest of the week, summer who goes on vacation and stay safe and we will be in touch. And thanks to Greg and to Hannah for kindly supporting us technically. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.